this was the cover of one of my favorite books when I was a, when I, when I was a kid. It's the story of a young boy who conquers his fear of the oceans by sailing off on his own, getting shipwrecked at sea, and finding his way back home again. I dreamed of being an adventurer and an explorer, and I loved the outdoors, but I had a problem. My folks are just not that outdoorsy. <laughs> They're two of the most amazing people on the face of the planet, true pioneers of education and the arts, but put them on a mountain with backpacks and compasses, and the world would lose a visionary educator and one of the greatest music teachers of all time. <laughs> I dreamed of adventure, so I had to find some other ways. Most kids have a mortal fear of being lost in the woods, but I used to fantasize that my parents would lose me in the woods, and I'd have to find my way back to, to land using only my survival skills. Well, they never did manage to lose me, so I settled instead for long walks up the creek by my house where I grew up. I'd pack a little knapsack with a book on the end of a stick like I imagine Huck Finn would do, and I set off. And it was on one of these adventures up the creek that I saw something that horrified me, even as an 11-year-old. Some local stables had dumped a huge pile of manure in my creek, the same creek that flowed into my ocean. So I went home and I wrote an impassioned letter to the stable owners, slipped it in their mailbox, and walked home triumphantly, thinking for sure they would never try that again. And you know what happened as a result of this one small action, one seemingly small action from a small child armed only with pen and paper? <laughs> Fast forward 20 years, I went back to school, I traveled the world, but I was still searching for a way to make a difference, some greater impact than I had when I was a kid writing that letter to the stable owner. And then, sitting in a lecture at a conference in Santa Barbara, I met my hero, Captain Charles Moore, who had discovered a massive area of the Pacific Ocean that was filling up with our garbage. It's called the North Pacific Gyre. It's a series of currents, circular currents, that creates a huge vortex in the oceans. It sweeps plastic from land out into the oceans, pulverizes it, and concentrates it. It's the ultimate case of out of sight, out of mind, until recently. And it's having a devastating impact on animals. Countless hundreds and thousands of marine animals are harmed by our plastic waste from land. They mistake it for food, and they can get strangled in it and get entangled in it. So in 2008, I had a chance to see this for myself. We were six crew aboard the ORV Algita, including the captain and his director of research, a former Marine with striking blue eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I barely noticed, <laughs> except for every single day. We sailed from Hawaii all the way back to Los Angeles, gathering samples um, of the surface of the ocean, and they look like this. Broken down fragments of plastic pollution from land, the occasional recognizable object mixed with the slurry of marine life. But it was at night that we saw something even more alarming. These tiny lanternfish at the base of our food chain surface only at night to feed. They feed on plankton normally, but we have now contaminated the surface of the ocean so much that they are feasting on our plastic. This plastic contains a host of toxic chemicals that can transfer to the tissues of these animals, working their way up the food chain as small fish eat bigger fish. And who's at the top of that food chain? We are. Now, if you were to look back on the log from February 14, 2008, this is what you'd see. Our position, the sea state, Marcus had fished a little piece of blue derelict fishing gear off the ocean surface, knit a tight blue ring, and proposed. Now, I'm not sure about this, but I think I might be the only woman in the world to have been proposed to in the middle of a garbage patch. <laughs> we got back to land determined to do something big to raise awareness about what we'd seen. Evidence that more plastic was getting into the ocean, but it was getting into the food chain. So we decided to build a boat, because that's what anyone would do. Out of 15,000 plastic bottles, which Marcus and our friend Joel Pascal would sail from California back to Hawaii, riding those same currents. We had school children from all over Los Angeles helping us collect bottles. And at one school, one little boy asked Marcus, aren't you going to glue the caps on those bottles? June 1st, 2008, we set sail from California. We set, said goodbye to the boat with throngs of supporters cheering us on. 
And then just three days into the voyage, I got a call from Marcus on the satellite phone with three words that I will remember for the rest of my life. Honey, we're sinking. Our boat had 2,000 Nalgene bottles, the kind with a screw top lid and little ridges around the edge, and we learned that ocean friction plus bottles equals you should have listened to that small boy. <laughs> Our raft was sinking. I saw my life flash before my eyes. This project that we had worked on for so long was literally falling apart. And this future that I dreamed of with the new love of my life was in danger. So I hopped on the phone, and 12 hours later, I found myself racing out to our sinking ship with six volunteers and a big box of glue. We spent the whole day bailing water out of the boat and gluing the caps back on the bottles, and it worked. Three months, three hurricanes, and many stories later, Marcus and Joel sailed into Hawaii. It was one of the best days of my life. But they brought with them very sobering news. This is a fish that Marcus caught roughly 500 miles off the coast of California, cut open the stomach, and found 17 pieces of plastic inside. Further proof that this plastic, our plastic, is getting into the food chain that we all depend on. Now, this was 2008. There was a fair amount known about plastic in the North Pacific gyre, but very little known about this issue globally, and zero research on the Southern Hemisphere. And now Marcus and I had a deeper sense of what was truly at stake. We thought one day we'd want to have a child of our own. But first, I wanted to better understand the chemicals in my own body. So we tested my blood, and we found trace levels of PCBs, DDT, PFCs, and flame retardants, all chemicals that have been shown to stick to plastic in the ocean, chemicals in my body that could pass on to my future baby through childbirth and breastfeeding. So, we decided to take it on with the naivete of two people who don't really know what they're getting into. We would start a new organization called the Five Gyres Institute with a mission to get to all five of the subtropical gyres, do the research, and then leverage our scientific findings to drive change on land. And with the help of dozens of volunteers around the world, we sailed 50,000 miles collecting hundreds and hundreds of samples, and this is what we found. 5.25 trillion particles of plastic pollution, weighing roughly 270,000 metric tons. Most of these particles are smaller than a grain of rice. We've turned our oceans into a plastic smog. Now, you can't clean up smog. The best you can do is prevent it from getting any worse. We've seen that these plastic particles all around the world, across the ocean surface, are untraceable. You can't point to a single country to be responsible and hold them accountable. You can't trace it back to a single product, and there's no one that you or any 11-year-old could write a letter to demanding that we stop dumping plastics into the oceans. But then, in 2012, we found something eerie in the Great Lakes. In partnership with Dr. Sam Mason from SUNY Fredonia University, we surveyed all five of the Great Lakes for plastic pollution, and we found one sample that astonished us. Over 1,200 microplastic particles, many of which were the same perfect spherical shape and size. We had never seen anything like this in any of our oceans, more plastic by count than any of the oceans so far. We had no idea what this was. And then Marcus and Dr. Mason went to Walmart, and bam, we found our culprit. Facial scrubs, body washes, toothpastes, Products that used to contain natural biodegradable exfoliants were now using plastic microbeads that were so small, they're flushing right out into our lakes, rivers, and oceans, the perfect size to be fish food. We even calculated that one single tube can have over 300,000 of these microplastic particles. So this was an opportunity now to go directly to the stables, in this case, to go to Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, with science on our side and a much stronger letter. Our partners in Europe, the Plastic Soup Foundation, had done this in Europe with Unilever. So in 2013, we drafted, Five Gyres drafted the first bill in California to ban the sale of products that contain microbeads. In 2014, we brought this directly to California Assembly member Richard Bloom. And in 2015, now with a growing coalition of NGOs around the country, we have seen statewide legislation being introduced and passing across the country. We have a federal bill on the table. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
But that's not all. <laughs> we have a federal bill on the table, and just last week, in the California Assembly, the microbeads ban passed through the Assembly. <laughs> this is truly the power of teamwork and community building. Now, we have a lot of good news to celebrate. There's a tremendous amount of awareness growing. Across the country and around the world, there are bans placed on single-use disposables, on plastic bags, on bottles, on some of the most egregious offenders. But as long as we see images like this around the world, we know the work is far from over. The challenges before us are enormous. But every one of us in this room makes choices every single day where we can be part of the solution. And I'm going to leave you with a couple simplistic ones, but they do add up. Avoid single-use plastic disposables. They end up in his backyard, the bottles, the bags, the straws. You can join watershed organizations and your local NGOs and get more informed. And you can join, most importantly, the fight to get money out of politics. Because what I keep coming back to is that even the smallest individuals amongst us can make a difference. As you probably guess, this is my daughter. We did end up <laughs> having a child. And this is the same creek that I used to play in as a child, a bit more concrete than I remember it having. But it's still a lifeline that connects our everyday actions on land to the oceans that sustain us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.